hello, hi, is well meant. And um, uh, it's, it'll be my start, I hope, of my Bulgarian linguistic journey. Um, um, for those of you who know me already, you're probably thinking, oh, please shut up. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I won't be speaking for that long, but I will be popping up throughout the day. Um, my name is Nick Byrne, um, I'm the director of the Language Centre at the London School of Economics and Political Science, LSE. Um, and I'm part of the project Blue Seed, um, known by its website as www.urbanlanguages.eu. Um, somebody said it sounded like an underground radio station. Right? <laughs> so, so, I rather like that, actually, so um, urban languages. So um, we're very, very lucky today, A, to be welcomed by Varna Free University um, in this amazing setting. I mean, I can't think there are many universities that are overlooking the sea, let alone the Black Sea. Um, we've got the last days of summer. I looked at the, um, the uh, meteo, the weather forecast for London on Saturday. It's 14 degrees and rain. So although I was a little bit hot climbing up that hill, I'm going to enjoy every uncomfortable feeling of heat for the next 48 hours, because that feeling won't come back again for a long time. Um, we've got a full day. Some people are going to be arriving a little bit later. Um, we've just sort of held up the scenes, but they will be coming this afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank, formally, at the start of the day, all the work that Varna has done, um, the, particularly the international office, and Gaiori Andres, who has really pulled together a lot of very, very difficult tasks, and I thank him very, very much. I also thank all of you to, um, uh, who've really made the effort to come here. And I think we actually, rather than end the day, we're actually going to start the day with a round of applause, thank you to the BFU team. So well done. Um, I'm going to introduce Brian Michael that I've um, met um, just now, Foreign Language Teaching Department, who's going to talk a little bit um, uh, about how languages are delivered here at BFU, and then I'm going to pass over to Liz King to give an introduction to the new C project. So, please. Wow. My name is Galina Shamonina, I'm the director of the Department of Foreign Languages here at Farm Free University. So, dear colleagues, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to Barn Free University as participants and guests of the international seminar The Challenges of Multilingual Urban Communities, the Southeast European Perspective. On behalf of the Department of Foreign Language Teaching, I'm glad to have you all among us today, having in mind that we work in the same field and share common interests. Let me briefly introduce the department to you. Um, I'll just emphasize a few points. First, the department provides language training to all university students, full-time, part-time and distance learning students. It reflects the specialist nature of the university, offering both general and specialized language courses in seven foreign languages for all bachelor's and master's degree programs. Second, the department organizes language practice for students and teaching staff in universities in Russia for those who learn Russian, Spain and Germany for Spanish and German language students. The department is a training center for the University of Cambridge certificate exams, including International Legal English Certificate. We are also an examination center for TRFL, Test of Russian as a Foreign Language. We have this year two new programs, Balkan Languages, Greek, Romanian, Serbian and Turkish as second foreign languages and uh, we are planning to offer Chinese and Japanese language courses too. The department works in close cooperation with the Russian Center at the University, 
the first opened on the Balkans in 2009. One of the most significant projects which the department coordinates is in cooperation with the Ruski Mir Foundation. It's an annual international event in the field of modern educational technologies in teaching foreign languages. Uh, over 260 students and teachers of Russian from nine European countries have acquired qualification during the five summer schools as part of this project. We also participate in projects under Leonardo Brunvik Komensky programs and some others. My main responsibilities at work are administrative and they take much of my time. But I'm blessed to work together with a highly experienced and qualified team of language teachers. You will have the pleasure to meet some of them uh, during the sessions. Let me introduce to you the moderators. Uh, Boriana Kostova, Peter Simeonova, and Ilen Dim. I wish you a pleasant stay here at Varna Free University and a useful exchange of ideas and opinions which hopefully will stimulate our future project and research activities. Okay, so I suggest that we start uh, the seminar. Um, now I would like to invite um, Mr. Victim King from the Languages Company in London uh, to give an introduction to the project instead. No, se zjadja vam, še dok ne, ne mora da govja na Bukarski. So, as you know, I will have to speak English. With an English accent. I will share with Joe. I wonder if the Bulgarians understood what I was saying. That would be a real challenge, wouldn't it? Uh, I mean in Bulgaria, not in English. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasant task to give you an overview of what this project, this wonderful project actually, has been about so far and where we might be going in the future, with a little help from at least one of my friends. Uh, and um, I hope that our partners who are here will have heard some of this many times, so if you have a tiring night, you can close your eyes a little bit, not at the beginning, but later on, when it will be the, the same thing that you've heard before, but you should know it very well anyway, as it's been part. So it's an overview of who, what, and to some extent why. Is this the best way of doing this? Languages and the city. But I wanted to start in a slightly different way, with a bit of an overview of a background of why the city and what is, what, why languages now. Because, so let, me, let me show you my, my plan, when we stick to it the city. So first of all, the city. Something about multilingualism and policy. The multilingual city now. The what and who have you seen? Progress so far, and you will see a mysterious Warner in this there. There's a Warner that will be coming to us now. Not so mysterious. And some first reports from the cities, which will lead into unrelated discussions. I think that uh, human beings are fairly ambivalent when one thinks about it, about the idea of the city. Uh, there is a long tradition of seeing the city as something dystopic and unpleasant, the dark satanic mills that uh, our William Blake used to talk about. And I've, I've followed some little quotations. Uh, I think there are some French speakers here who saw cities are the abyss of the human species. Uh, I also very much like the Alexandrian Darius Galati who wrote a very famous poem about cities, which basically said the city will destroy your life. And you said you'd go to another country, a better place than this, but wherever you go, the city will follow you. The city will always pursue you. 
We walk the same streets, grow old in the same neighbourhoods, turn grey in the same houses. You'll always end up in this city. Don't hope for anything else. Well, that's the most depressing part of our country. But it is interesting, isn't it? That the city has often been seen in that very negative way. One thinks of it from our country. I mentioned Blake, but also Dickens, and from, from Russia, Tolstoy, the dream of the country, Dostoyevsky cities were pretty horrible places. And so, of course, the 19th century city probably was. And there is another view of the city as being a place of progress, of change, of development, uh, and human advancement. And particularly in recent years, I think a lot of people have been analyzing the city, the role that the city plays, uh, and giving it some very, making some very significant statements uh, about that. So an alternative um, could be from modern culture, the urban, uh, the urban culture that Nick sort of referred to, from American film, from American novel, the city becomes something different. The city is the future. The city on the hill, the golden city. And I found there are two references I want to give you, which I found very interesting. One is that Steven Pinker, who you've probably heard of. He's a social psychologist. He's written about language uh, quite a lot. The language instinct is his very famous. And more recently, he produced this very fat volume about the end of how violence has disappeared from, or has diminished significantly, despite what people say, in human society. He calls it the better angels of our nature. And in one section, he talks about how the city, in particular the cosmopolitan city, brings together a critical mass of diverse minds, which is both creative but also makes it very difficult for tyrants and kings to control because there, there, are, there is so much ferment and ideas going on in the city. He, he and others have made a, a thesis that the city has been at the centre of the development of our civilization. Another urbanist, and of course we have uh, a very uh, Nick mentioned LSE. At the LSE, there is the LSE cities who are analyzing cities across the world in many, many different ways, in very interesting ways. Somebody who spoke at their, one of their events last year uh, was a man, Edward Glazer, you might have heard of him. And that's what he says cities enable the collaboration that makes humanity shine most brightly. And that was in a recent book of his called Triumph of the City, uh, which you might like to read. I think I found a very interesting uh, discussion. So we have on the one hand that dystopian view of the, the horrors of the city, and on the other, the cities as the mark and sign of civilization and development. In our images, taken from the project, you can sort of see all of that there. There are some of our cities which are friendly and progressive, but also I suppose the view in the top left, it's like the film Metropolis, isn't it? And those, those traditions are filled with very impressive places, not shining places. But I think we are taking a slightly different view. Because in the city, the city is the place where traditionally, and there's nothing new about this, I'll come to what might be new in a moment, but it's not, it's not a new phenomenon that ideas and culture have flourished within the city context in this part of the world, uh, no less than anywhere else. So if you think of classical Athens, and people very often say, how could it be that in the same city, within a few decades, we had Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides and Aristophanes and Pericles and, 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 and Socrates and Plato, well, how could it be? It's because they were feeding from each other. Those people went there. And a similar phenomenon happened in many vibrant cities through time, particularly the cities that were more open. So you might say the same thing about Renaissance Venice and Florence. How could it be that all these artists suddenly appeared there? It wasn't magic. It was a reaction, an interaction. The Dutch Golden Age, people went to those cities uh, to discuss ideas, firm ideas, and actually Pinker, who's a, I won't read it now, he's a very good description about how people 
like Leibniz would find refuge in the Dutch cities where they would discuss with other people of like opinion. John Locke was going to Leiden and Amsterdam uh, during that period and so on. And we could go on. Developments in uh, democracy, ideas of democracy in, in, in states. I also saw a reference to something simple but obvious. Apparently, Chicago, in the early part of the 19th century, four or five people developed the concept of the skyscraper. It was in this for them doing that in Chicago, the little windy city, but the four great architects who were involved in that process. And we think of the 19th century in London, Paris, Berlin, and now Shanghai, Tokyo, Mumbai. The ferment of ideas, culture, and development happens in those cities. So there is a long history. And I think that is best summed up again by a quotation from our friend Mr. Glazer. The only city And then we see a reference to something that interests us very much in the receipt. It is about movement and mobility into the cities, within countries, but also from other countries. And I've emphasized that last sentence. Because what is interesting, also, is that all of this current work that goes on, and I think Gerald Yanko will be speaking later, but I'm going to confirm this, uh, about the importance of the city, the growth of the city, the, the, the rise and triumph of the city, very little mention language, communication, the thing, the, the way that people operate. And that is what we are trying to understand better uh, within Lucy. We're very happy to be in this part of the world also because there are, of course, big precedents in, southeast, in the southeast for these kind of multilingual phenomena. I don't want to do go back too far, but I was, I was fascinated reading your report, the Rana report, about Odessus and the centuries of immigration into this area. I think the Bulgarians didn't, was, were not a majority in Rana until relatively recently in history. There were people from all other parts of the area. Yuxain, I think, it, or Efksain, I think say it right. in, in, in Bulgaria. It's a Greek word. Yeah, it's Oxemos. Oxemos. It's the Black Sea. It was the, name, the original name of the Black Sea. I think it was Greek irony because it meant that it's good for foreigners or good for strangers. But actually, they very often have a phrase like that which meant exactly the opposite because it was well known for storms. But the fact that the Xenos was part of the, the, the idea of the Black Sea is itself significant, I think, because of the movement of trade around and people coming to uh, the different cities. So that is something traditional in this area. I also found in the Sofia uh, report about toleration, the idea of accepting otherness. Back in 311, Galerius apparently was a Bulgarian, or Sofia born at least, uh, uh, emperor, Roman emperor, and he issued the edict of toleration for other beliefs, religions in advance, many in advance, or men in Sofia or Celtica. See what we learn from Lucy. We can think of our colleagues from Cyprus. There are challenges in Cyprus, but Cyprus has traditionally been a multilingual place. And of course, the Ottoman Empire and the Austro Hungarian Empire, whatever else they were, they did not impose single languages. They survived for centuries and multilingual. So there is, there is history to all of, all of this, uh, in this area in particular, but also in general. So what is special about our language? What's different? Well, I think we'll come to see that in terms of the changes, the major changes that are taking place in our society. And the context of that, my second context, of course, is European policy on language. The European Union and the Council of Europe. The European Union has been promoting the idea of multilingualism as something essential for the unity of the And that is something quite unique, I think, uh, to, to have that kind of development. The idea of unity in diversity being promoted as a 
political statement. It's not time to sum up all of the European policies on uh, multilingualism. We might ask our colleague from the European Union if she would like to say something about that at a later time. But really for the last 20 years, I would say, there has been massive development, and in the Council of Europe as well, in terms of taking forward ideas about uh, multilingualism and how it should operate. We summed that up in an earlier piece of work in five broad areas of belief, policy, if you like, in relation to multilingualism in the European continent. Firstly, that multilingualism, language support for language learning was absolutely indispensable for communication and mobility. The idea that the entity cannot operate unless people can communicate across borders and across cultures. That it was primarily about people learning, usually in school, acquiring new competences, developing their skills as a speaker of another language, and a lot of resources that we put into that. One fundamental belief of great importance has been that languages are all equal. Now in practice it might not work out like that, and we know that there are particular roles played by the English language, uh, and also other large languages of communication, such as French, Russian, and so on, in different areas. Nevertheless, the principle of establishing equality is extremely important, particularly for the less used languages, and that has been central to the whole idea. As well as communication, or arising from communication, languages are there for mutual understanding. We understand each other better, we understand each other's culture better through understanding the language. And this can also, also be a big impact, or should have an impact on exchange, prosperity, and trade. That really is our summary, it's not an official statement, our summary of some of the main threads and trends in European policy on languages and multilingualism. Now, in an earlier project, and sadly, uh, I mean, we don't have the publication anymore, but you might want to see it on the web, it's still available there. Uh, I mean, may indeed reprint it. Uh, has a horrible acronym, NATPP. There are all kinds of things you could imagine it means, but it means Languages in Europe, Theory, Policy and Practice. And this publication, towards 2020, which Joe contributed to, and Maria Stoicher also contributed to, from, from Sofia, uh, analyzed broad, in broad terms European and national policies on language. And came to some conclusions that we, were, we needed to move on. That what had been done, it says there somewhere, was heroic and in many ways successful, but the new situations demanded for some new solutions. And I think that we are in a state now, in my judgment, in the, in the countries of Europe, that we are looking for some new solutions. Not rejecting what has been done, but saying that it has become more complicated, more complex. There are bigger demands in, in relation to language. Why is this? Well, I think you're familiar really with the reasons. It's to do, for example, and we talk about this in the book, with the way that we now work. Working is about primarily, but largely or increasingly about communication and communication across borders, international communication. We need ways of doing that. We're working is not traditionally working on a production line where speaking is not what you're supposed to do, it is about communicating and developing and creating together. And the way we communicate, particularly through the development of electronic communication, has expanded, developed enormously. At one time people said that means that English will be the only language, but we see that has not been the case. That the internet is expanding in all oh, English is undoubtedly growing in the internet, but so are other languages too, and in a greater numbers. The amount of communication becomes uh, phenomenal. I could not imagine it in previous years. 
And I think perhaps most of all, in terms of giving us a contextual challenge, mobility, which always happened, as I suggested, in this area as much as anywhere else. Travelling, trade around the Black Sea, and wars, and so on. But the mobility of the early 21st century, which has been analysed by a number of writers, which we refer to in our book, and Joe has talked about this a lot as well, has been unprecedented, both in terms of who is moving. All classes, sexes, all types of people are moving and where they're moving to and from. One of the interesting things about our project is that we are looking at the impact of immigration and some of the cities involved have traditionally been places where people left, not, where, not places that welcomed a new immigrants. So how they have, Dublin is an example, Athens is an example, uh, how they have managed that transition from exporting to import and export. So that kind of mobility has created enormous challenges for our society, but also opportunities. The emergence of English as a lingua franca, I will say it as simply as that, without going into that much in great detail, or as a special kind of language, if you like, also creates new contexts and challenges for multilingualism. I think not antagonistic ones, but we have to understand and think about that. And of course, the current economic crisis is also an issue because that has an impact on ideologies, the way people think, the way that politicians react, and in particular to the emergence of nationalisms as which could be opposed to the idea of multiculturalism, multinationalism. So those new contexts mean that we have some new issues to face, new challenges to deal with. Those are some of them, which I'm not going to talk at length at all. For example, the model that we use may need to be developed and changed. We may need to think more about what education in school should be like for a multilingual existing population and about learning outside school, where a lot of language learning is taking place. And one of our, and our sixth conclusion was where we are now, would bring us to where we are now, that a lot of this change was already happening within the context of the city. We saw the city as a potential driver of change, which is why we conceived of and developed a partnership working on these issues around the UC project. A multilingual city, we have said, could be seen as a working model of the future. This is where it will happen first. Going back to what I said about cities being in the vanguard, the driving change, the same applies to the area we're looking at. And also, not always, but in many cases, the city does not have to follow national policy, absolutely. A city like London, a city like Hamburg, a city like Quebec, they can develop city policies, which fit their context, of course, taking account of what national uh, frameworks allow. But there is much more latitude within the city. And even more so, people within the city make change in any case. Because the city, as we put it, is a locus for multiculturalism, multilingualism, in all its aspects. Where I live in East London, large numbers of people speak Bengali. There doesn't need to be a law that says you need to speak Bengali. Things happen in that language. Whether it's health notices, shops, whatever. So change takes place. And a fourth phenomenon which we think is very interesting, taking us back to that quotation from Blaise, cities link to other cities. In another context, I think Joe wrote something saying the concept of here changes because of within the context of the city. The context of neighbor changes. We talked about, we talk about in the project learning your neighbor's language, which was a favorite 
European concept at one point. But who is your neighbor if you live in London? It's going to be somebody in Mumbai, or New York, or Dhaka, or Johannesburg, or Melbourne. It's where the aeroplane will take you. It's no longer the, the, the nearest village. So that's what excited us about the idea of a multi city. But as I said, we found that very little was said, written, about the multilingualism of the city, which is what we wanted to find out more about. So, this is our network. In Europe, 13, lucky 13 uh, cities, and beyond, in Melbourne, and Ottawa, I said Ottawa Plus because they brought in a number of other Canadian cities as well. So that's who we are, and most of, most of those cities are represented here uh, today. Our aims, you might imagine, to analyze and report on what's happening, to reflect on policies which could better support multilingualism. So where are good things happening? Could that become a policy where things are more difficult? What can be done about that? And we examine the links between the cities. And finally, and you will help us with this, pose a vision for the future. What will the mountain or city look like? Or what kind of things will they look like? Because they won't all be the same, but they might be common characteristics of the vision of the city of the future. We developed some key themes. Partly, when I say this without uh, cynicism in, in front of our colleagues on admission, partly of course the themes are determined by what the call says are priorities, but they fitted us very well. So we wanted to have a good practice in language learning for the people arriving in the city, training and support about social inclusion, what happens in the health service, the social services, etc. This interculturalism, awareness raising support for neighboring languages, whatever they might be, and in some places that's a very acute and political question. Particularly, I think, in the East. What is your neighboring language uh, in Austria? It's a challenging question. Intercultural, but those could all look like they're negative things, but it's not. We also want to look at the dialogue between people, the celebration of community cultures within cities which take place. And the, 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 the sounds and shape and colour of the city, of the multilingual city, as a vibrant place to live, and how people think about that. And of course, the challenge I mentioned earlier, how newer cities are reacting to this, uh, not newer cities, but cities which have not been faced with the kind of mobility we've been talking about until more recently. We organise that by themes. And we run already a workshop on each of those themes, education, public sphere, economic life, private and urban space. Each one is a different city, which involves also visiting and finding out and seeing. And that's been a very rich and rewarding experience from which we have developed some reports, mostly draft at the moment, some complete reports from the cities. That is the story so far. So we set up the project. We have a seminar. This will be the first seminar in Utrecht. So a place which was part of the golden age I was talking about. And now we're in the Black Sea for the second seminar. Not in the Black Sea, but in the Black Sea. Maybe later in. We've carried out research in all the cities. Interviewing key stakeholders and producing these city reports, and we have run the five workshops. So that's what's happened in the last year and a half. And I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Lorna, who's going to tell us a little bit about what we found and how we carried out the research. And then I'll come back to the just to say a few last remarks. Thank you, Liz. Um, I've been allocated 10 minutes for this, so you know it will be short. Some of you heard more yesterday. This, this morning is just to give you a flavor of what we've discovered in our research activities, which is one pillar of what our network does. Um, who I am, I think 
really has an impact on what I do. And that's the same for each of your research teams. So I'm representing a research team of about 80 researchers that I've coordinated in, the, in, the, in this project. So when I say some of these things, this is not me, this is their work. And actually I've tried to use as much as possible from the um, interview transcripts. So it's the words of stakeholders. So none of the glory is mine. Um, but some of the findings are very rich and very suggestive. So apologies for those of you who heard snapshots of this yesterday. It will not be too repetitive. Um, when we reflect on what it is to be a European, I, I come from the very, very north of Ireland. I speak a dialect that not very many people understand as dialect of Scots. That's the object of some controversy. Um, I speak English as a native speaker, but I don't speak British English or American English. I learn French, I speak French. And now, like many Europeans, I'm starting to learn an Asian language. So I see in myself sometimes these tied things, a minority language, a regional language, an official language, a big language, a small language. And a lot of what my journey has been in language learning is reflected in what we see today. I teach um, courses at master's levels on multilingualism and students are actually really interested now by the city and they find it a sexy area of research, which is interesting because more than half of us have moved to the city, but most of us have moved to the city for work because we had to, not because we wanted to, and many of us want to return to the countryside at the weekends during our holidays. And we don't necessarily see the city as somewhere where we want to stay. And many citizens just dream of escaping to the countryside. So I think in Europe there is this tension between country and city. And our transcripts reflect that. I've been reading a, a great book um, similar to what actually Lid has been reading. We've got the same bedside tables by Katz and Bradley. And it's a book called The Metropolitan Revolution. And they argue that this multi-ethnic complex and globally connected city, rather than the country or the state or the nation state, is the powerhouse of the future. And I think I agree when I compare my experience in the country and my experience in the city. And they write that in this world in which people live, operate, communicate and engage through networks, cities have emerged as the uber network. Internet firms, institutions and individuals working together across sectors, disciplines, jurisdictions, artificial political borders, and yes, even political parties. And in Ireland, we do see that, where there's cooperation politically, very tense on a national level, but the city of Belfast wants to promote itself no matter what the divisions are. So that's been a challenge. So, very briefly, our research design has been conducted in two phases. We gathered secondary data, we gathered examples of multilingualism and research on multilingualism. So we looked at the examples and we looked at reports, recent reports. And then after that we formulated some hypotheses and we conducted some primary data, mainly through interviews. And that's what I'm going to report on today. And why? Not just because we're curious, but because we want to do something with our curiosity, feed into the content of these activities, and work together, perhaps, to suggest this vision for how it could be. So that's what we've done so far. Um, and we've developed a set of hypotheses, and I'm not going to linger on these, because my talk yesterday responded to each of these hypotheses in more detail. But our hypotheses focused on visibility, affordances or things that encourage multilingualism and challenges or obstacles which impede multilingualism. And you can read some of these in more detail on our website. I'm not going to keep them up too long. I'm going to skip to the next slide. Okay, so these are my buzzwords. And had this been in French, it would have been terrific because I could have started with un in at the start of every word, but I couldn't. So it's invisible, inaudible, inaccessible, and unimaginable. This is multilingualism or plurilingualism for many of our respondents. We've just talked about these diverse cities, but yet for many people, multilingualism in society or plurilingualism in an individual is invisible, inaudible, inaccessible, and unimaginable. So you can see in our discussions later today whether you agree or disagree with what they say. Much of our data suggests that multilingual simply is not seen by people. And we talk 
about this with Ingrid Gogolet, who's defined the term of a habitus, a monolingual habitus. People live in a monolingual bubble. Sometimes they live in a multilingual bubble. They have their languages, but we don't see other languages. And there seem to be psychological reasons to say that we don't decode that which we do not know. We simply look at it, we ignore it, and we focus on what we do know. So somehow we live in multiple bubbles, some monolingual and some multilingual, but we don't necessarily see the other. That's a big debate and that's a big discussion for another day. And when it is seen and heard, it's not seen as sensitive. So many people say, oh, no, 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 multilingualism is not sensitive in our city. That was the first question we asked in the interviews. Is multilingualism a sensitive issue in your city? No. But yet the very same respondents who say that it's not sensitive go on to describe very controversial issues, very difficult issues, lots of tensions. You see the tension here? Not difficult to explore. So in Varna, um, language is not seen as a sensitive issue by many officials. And where multilingualism is discussed, there's a preference for official languages rather than an inclusive multilingualism which incorporates the languages actually spoken in the city. So it's not seen as problematic because, well, you've got a certain number of official languages people can speak and communicate through those and we're not going to worry about those languages that are actually speaking and spoken in the city. Let's not worry about those. So that's one optic. In Hamburg, to most, language diversity encompasses mostly foreign languages and is considered an asset. Very few include minority and migrant languages and close to none include sign languages. So that aspect of multilingualism is highly sensitized. In Sofia, Roma are the largest minority, and yet respondents do not acknowledge that their language is visible or needs a boost, and it's largely neglected from that point of view. And in Dublin, do you consider yourself to be monolingual or bilingual or multilingual? Monolingual, I suppose, but with good levels of Irish. <laughs> That's Gaelic. And the case of Roma students in Dublin, so we have uh, lots of Roma students in our education system. This is a clash, a tension. A teacher says they are on a conveyor belt moving towards state exams without the required supports in place. And then the state or the city decides to give them support, so what do they do? The same interview mentions the incongruity of students who are illiterate in their first language being proposed the use of English language dictionaries as reasonable accommodation when taking final state examinations. How helpful! <laughs> That's the invisibility, not actually seeing the problem sometimes. Inaudibility. In Varna, I have had problems, not because of a lack of proficiency in Bulgarian, but because in Bulgaria there are Russophiles and Russophobes. In Hamburg, the general public in Hamburg, Germany, is not open to multilingualism. If you speak Turkish in a bus or train, people look at you strangely, and it's not a curious look, but rather a downgrading look. A different look than when you speak English. My daughter was asked why she spoke Turkish. Why? And in Dublin, I, I don't want to, you know, my city has to appear that too because we, we all share some of these invisibilities. In Dublin, I think we're not terribly attuned to language generally. And on a personal basis, I'm probably asked three times a week what language I'm speaking when I'm speaking Irish by Irish people. Rel relatively recently, I was racially abused on a bus when I was speaking on the phone to my father in Irish. A woman started blasting that she was sick of us and we were taking jobs and her daughter was <laughs> new work and that was because of the likes of us. <laughs> and then people occasionally get defensive, shy around me when I'm speaking Irish. People ask me what language I'm speaking and the response is, well I always hated Irish in school, I can't stand it. And it initiates a strong emotional response whether positive or negative. And in our Dublin interviews, as I mentioned, five of the 13 interviewees describe themselves as monolinguals, despite learning and using other languages. So someone is monolingual, but they speak English and French. Monolingual with minimal French, Spanish, Italian, Russian, and Irish. <laughs> monolingual, I suppose, but with good language of Irish. Monolingual, however, I have recently started learning the Korean language, and monolingual with some French and Irish. Now, these are funny from a linguistic perspective, because I am a linguist, that's my job. But this is normal because we have a view of normative multilingualism, a normative model of what multilingualism is, and that's a balanced, 
sequential bilingualism or multilingualism where you add languages, you have balanced competences written and spoken, and you sound like a native speaker, perhaps you have a little bit of an accent. But in society, there is a model of multilingual out there, and we are not communicating what real multilingualism and plurilingualism actually is. And in accessibility then, we actually found it quite hard to get data in some areas. So in Dublin, we couldn't get any data on home languages in schools because it's not made public and it's held very tightly by one inspectorate. And in Strasbourg, in a secular um, state, you actually can't ask those questions. And in Varna, we have the interviewee asking, any data on students with minority or migrant backgrounds? The interviewee says, no, it's considered that such data should not be collected by authorities officially. Two or three years ago, a deputy minister included a question about ethnic background in the questionnaire that had to be filled by students. And that deputy minister was fired as not being sensitive to problems that can occur, like discrimination. And in Dublin, we have exactly the same situation as in Varna. And unimaginable. This brings me to the end. But for many respondents, the multilingual city is another city. It's a big city, a metropolis skyscrapers, a melting pot. It's not their city. Again, it's a normative view of what the city, a multilingual city is. It's New York. And their own city isn't conceptualized as multilingualism. And as we mentioned in Sophia, it seems to be a focus on foreign language learning. English is visible there, so that's worth more. How about Turkish? You hear it, but you don't see it. And in closing, we have the impression, I've given a little linguistic star there, which means I'm citing an example that I don't agree with. And um, there are two groups for whom plurilingualism is part of a lived reality. The wealthy bilingual elite and the migrant whose languages contribute little to their human capital who struggle with the languages of the host community. That comes back to Glazer's comment that you've got migrants contributing to society at the top end and at the bottom end. But what about the middle? What about helping people move up and um, contribute more to their own human capital, earn more and um, be more prosperous? So, as I hand over back to Liz and, and turn to Joe, really we are seeing a two-tier multilingualism in our data. There's a focus on English and a focus on elites and a focus on migrants. But how do we conceptualize a more transformative model of multilingualism where your languages are taken into account, are visible, audible, the data is accessible, and we see this problematic status where it's a deficit, it's a problem to be handled rather than something that can be used as a resource. And very much in our respondents, we have seen that it's seen as somebody else's reality, and it's the concern of a bigger city, a city with longer experience, and it's something that those people don't feel is being handled so well. I'm looking forward to exploring these in more detail with Joe in our carousels later on. So back to Liz. Sums up some things that Lorna has already referred to, and that Angela will be talking about again later on this afternoon. Uh, the city reports that have come in, I've read them all now and find not very interesting and rich material. I'll just refer to some of them, which sum up perhaps some of the challenges and issues, some of which uh, Lorna has already referred to. Firstly, the problem of data. There are a lot of cities where it is impossible to know. There are estimates and so on, but a lot of census data doesn't exist in some countries, about languages spoken uh, in the education system or at home. This was something we identified in another project called Language Mature, uh, which called on the European Union to support the process of reliable information uh, about the languages that are spoken. We're actually, in one sense, fortunate in the UK in that respect, because that is a census question. It's a problematic census question, but it is a census question. What is your the language you speak at home? difficult question to answer for some people. So there's a problem with data. There is a problem in many, many cities identified of infrastructure. There isn't the infrastructure there to cope with uh, the influx of new people. What should we do? How should we create uh, the systems to, to deal with that? And in many areas, we are identifying mixed responses. So something is done in the field of education. Something is done in civil society, but quite often it's, it's what we call symbolic. Um, that will say welcome 
in 10 languages, but that's it. Uh, for something useful, uh, you won't get it. Uh, the, my favorite example is when you come to London, if you get on the Gatwick Express, you will be told that you're on a train in six languages, and you're told when you can get off the train, which is fairly obvious, because it only goes to one place. And you won't be told where to get a taxi, or to buy a ticket, or anything useful, unless you speak English. Uh, for the economy, multilingualism is more often seen as a problem than a benefit in the reports that we're getting back. Yet, we know that this is not the case. But that is what they're saying. And, of course, in some places more than others, there is a, this is becoming a very hot political issue. I mean, Athens, of course, our colleagues are not here, where you have far right parties speaking in our language could be a matter for violence, not, not just what we heard about here. Uh, not, not simply, uh, I don't like it, but I'm not kidding. But on the other hand, diversity is everywhere. Even if people haven't noticed it, it's there. And we're seeing that from last week's report, which is very fascinating. And we do identify that dichotomy of the elite in, our, in, in London. The Russians in London are an elite bilingual group. The well-educated British are an elite bilingual group. And there are other groups as well. And they don't always meet. And again, on a more positive the sounds and appearance of many cities are changing as a result of all of these phenomena develops. And attitudes, I think, actually are mixed. Uh, they can be apprehensive, they can be antagonistic, but they can also be open. And um, that also is something we need to understand. So I hope I give you some idea of where we are, where we come from, what we've got to. Do you want to say something before we introduce? Um, maybe the audience there they have some questions to, to you to, to ask maybe. Um, First of all, I would like to thank you for coming to take both presenters for their interesting uh, presentations. And I would like to ask with the following question. Do you find it paradoxical that definitely in the era of multilingualism, we're still talking about English is being a global language. I mean, the language of politics, of sports events, media, of internet, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I don't know if I find it paradoxical, but I think that there is, as, as we identified in our earlier work, uh, and many people have identified, we, we cannot treat, there's a, there's a phrase in English about the elephant in the room, which means there's an elephant and nobody talks about it, and English is the elephant in the room about any discussion on multilingualism. Because we know that a lot of what is described as multilingualism in Europe is actually learning English. <laughs> yeah. If you look at the statistics for school learning of languages, every country is teaching English and less other languages. However, I think two things about that. I think that what, what our global society is showing is that it's not that you have more English and less of everything else. It's more and more. It's, it can be and should and it's more of everything. So it, if you look at the internet, Chinese, Spanish grow on the internet. People are communities of smaller languages are finding a voice. So Polish people in London can be talking to Polish people in Warsaw because of that. So actually technology is helping both to happen. That's what we have to come to terms with. And one of my great ambitions, uh, if you like, uh, before I grow too old to have ambitions, would be to persuade organizations like the British Council, who are moving in that direction, that they are not simply about promoting English, but about finding ways that English can support more multilingualism. Because to me it's obvious, fairly obvious, that if you are a Bulgarian who has learned English, that gives you a very good start towards learning French or German, uh, through that process of learning English. So I think that, I think it is, yeah, it is paradoxical, but also it's not hopeless. It's, it's an interesting development. Thank you very much, Well, there is another question to add to the because they are really like a rich source of 
the seed project and of course you can discover any differences and new issues came up that can also be compared to all these new products. And, but what most of them may have a common is that um, multilingualism was, was always there in the past because um, I mean this is a feature that many um, cities have common and the constellation for the cities of the different ethnicities and languages are different, but the fact that there has been multilingualism throughout history uh, accounts for most of them. But this is what we have today um, prevailing, and there has been before the area of the nation state building and the destroying of the languages and the ethnicities. This is something that many different cities have uh, in common makes it really clear in the parts of Any other questions or comments on 